Well, welcome back, church family, again. Today we're going to be in the book of Colossians chapter 1. Read along with me as I read verses 9 and 10. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. Prayer changes things. He goes on, And to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will, to know God's will, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, we know that wisdom and spiritual understanding is revealed in God's word by God's Holy Spirit. And he goes on in verse 10, because you would know God's will and be filled with spiritual or wisdom and spiritual understanding that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. You know, we have said for the last several weeks, every believer should seek to know the will of God in their life. God created us. He created us with purpose. We should want to know what that purpose is specifically for us in our life. You know, I said every believer should want to know the will of God. But what happens if we're not a believer? Before we can understand the will of God, and one thing I'll say even for unbelievers, is God wants all men, all women, all people to be saved. He wants everyone to come to the knowledge and truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if someone doesn't accept that truth when it is revealed by the Holy Spirit to them, the gospel message is preached, that God is, is our creator, that he he created us to be in a relationship with him. He allows us to have free will. And because of that, sin has entered the world. Sin is anything against God's righteous design. Sin separates us from God. It, it does away with our fellowship with God. But God has made a way, not by what we've done, but by what he has done. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for all sin and to defeat death by being raised from the dead three days later, that those that would believe in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And so those that believe that message become believers, and those that choose to deny that message are unbelievers. They may be atheist or agnostic. Who knows what terminology we would throw around at it, but the truth is you either are a Christian believing in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've accepted his Holy Spirit into your life, or you've not. And if you haven't, then you have quenched the Holy Spirit's work. You've put out the Holy Spirit's fire in your life. So for believers... We have been going through the last several weeks um, in focusing in on understanding the will of God. We've been using Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 as one of our scriptural examples of how to position ourselves in the right place, the right uh, mind frame to be able to receive and know the will of God. Read along with me, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye number Number one, present, that means to consecrate, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Then we see number two, be not conformed to this world. Don't be conformed, but separate away from the world. We present ourselves, we separate from the world. Then he says, but be ye transformed. That's the third one. We need transformation to take place in our life. How does that happen? By the renewing of our mind that we may prove what is good, acceptable, and the perfect will of God. The fourth thing we understand here is that we would prove or confirm by God's word God's will for our life. We've been going through these the last several Sundays. And um, if you've not tuned into those messages, I ask you to go back and look at this entire series thus far. This is sermon number five to get a complete understanding of what Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, what Paul is saying in this book about positioning ourselves or understanding the will of God in our life. So, consecration. I present. I'm a believer. I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I want to present myself to God. 
And as I present myself, I'm presenting myself a living sacrifice. I've got to get away from the world, separate myself from the world's way of thinking. That doesn't mean I lock myself in a box. It just means I have to start looking through biblical lens. That's walking after the Spirit, allowing the Holy Spirit to work and lead in my life. And as I separate from the world, I am able to now allow my mind to be transformed by God's Word. How about if I don't separate from the world? How about if I want to stay and continue to look at things from the world standards? Then I will quench the Holy Spirit's work in my life. I will grieve that Holy Spirit. There will be no work. The Holy Spirit will be upset and there will be a separation between me and my fellowship with God. God wants us to be transformed to the point that we can walk in His Spirit. Three things we've said about the Holy Spirit and the believer. One is quench not the Holy Spirit. It's the first negative. Don't stop the Holy Spirit's power in your life. Secondly, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Grieving the Holy Spirit, we talked last Sunday, is by sin. All sin grieves the Holy Spirit. But we'll see today one sin in particular that, that really grieves or stops the Holy Spirit's work in our life. The second negative, grieve not the Holy Spirit. And then today we're going to see a third one added in. It's the one positive. We quench not the Spirit. We grieve not the Spirit but we should all walk in the Spirit. That comes from the book of Galatians chapter 5. Read along with me. It says this, Galatians 5, 25. If we live in the Spirit, what that means, you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Instantly, His new creature, His new Spirit has come into your life. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. That shows us that the Holy Spirit can be in your life and you not walk after that Spirit. But Paul is telling us in these books as we go through, you want to know the will of God? Accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's got to be your starting point. Stop playing around. Present yourselves to God, a living sacrifice. God, here I am. Use me. I can do nothing a part of you in my life. In that understanding, let me separate myself from everything I've ever relied on in the world, in the world's way of thinking. Let me rely on you, God, that separation from the world. And then allow me to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. What does that look like? As I get into your word, as the Holy Spirit speaks truth to me, as I read and meditate on your word, as I listen to the Holy Spirit, and as I pray to you, allow my mind to be transformed transformed into your truths, and I will be able to confirm the things I see as your will in my life by the Holy Spirit's leading and by your word. We see in Romans 12 too, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. We see this same verbiage about allowing our minds to be transformed in Ephesians 4 23 and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and ye put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and truly holiness. Now I want us to get a a little more practical today. I hope to be able to bring some truths out at a new level for some of us, an understanding of God's Word at a very basic level that could change our life. It could change the way we view things and understand. And with that, I want us to go to the book of 1 John. I alluded there last week. I want us to spend a little bit more time there this week. So go with me to the book of 1 John chapter 1. We're going to look at this entire chapter, understanding the will of God in our life. Now, um, we see this written in John chapter 1, 1 John chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. 
we see that John is starting out by stating, we're going to tell you about the Savior, which we've heard about, we've been taught about, which we have seen with our own eyes, touch with our own hands, who we know is the word, the truth of the word of life. He goes on in verse 2. For life was manifested, and we have seen it. His life was created, and we bear witness. We've seen it, actual testimony. And we bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. It was revealed to the disciples. What we see in these two first verses, as we start at ground zero, the beginning of our faith, our life of understanding God's will in our life begins with true faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the starting point. We see from this text, they're pointing back. We have firsthand knowledge. We've seen this. It's all about Jesus Christ and what he did. God's love for man through the actions of Jesus Christ. He goes on. If you believe this, if you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, there's a promise that comes in verse 2. Excuse me, verse 3. That which we have seen and heard, we declare unto you, <clears throat> and truly, excuse me, we declare unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. We're telling you this true message about God's love for you, and now He has righted, He's rectified the division between us and God through what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And if you put your faith in that truth, you now have fellowship with the writers of this book, the disciples, but also it says fellowship with God through Jesus Christ. So upon our true faith in the gospel message of Jesus, we now have fellowship with God. Hey, God designed us to be in fellowship with him. Isn't that wonderful? This is the way he is made. We see a third point come out in verse 4. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit comes into my life. I instantly, because of my faith, have fellowship with God. God designed me to be in fellowship. And as long as I have fellowship with God through my faith in Jesus Christ, my joy will be full. You know, the truth is, I see a lot of Christians today that really don't show an image that their joy is full. And in fact, sometimes we look at our brothers and sisters in Christ and we say, that individual is quite bitter. They're not full of the joy of Jesus Christ, the joy that is promised for every Christian. What has happened? Somewhere along the line, fellowship has been removed. Something has happened to the fellowship between the individual and God, and their joy has been removed. Now, we say these three, they're the starting point of what we understand of the will of God here, putting ourselves in position to set us up for what is said in verses 4 through verse 10. Come along with me. It says this in verse 4. Excuse me, verse 5. These then, this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So I want you to get this thought for a minute. God is compared to light. And because he is light, he illuminates. There is no darkness. Now we commonly say light is right, light is with God, darkness is sin, darkness is a part of God. It's partially true, but we want to go even deeper than that thought. God is light, and there is no darkness around him at all. I want you to think about this. If you were to go into a dark room, all the lights off, you shut the door, it is pitch black. And you turn on a flashlight. As long as that light has power, it runs the darkness away. The darkness cannot overcome the light, but the light pushes the darkness away. It illuminates the darkness. I want you to think about that. God is light. 
He's not going to allow darkness around because he's going to illuminate the area. Darkness is going to go away. Hold that thought. Let's go a little bit further. It says this in verse 6. If we say we have fellowship with him. How do we have fellowship? We accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. The Holy Spirit comes into our lives. We have fellowship with God. All right? And when we have that fellowship, our joy can be full. If we say that we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we lie and we don't know the truth. What does it mean to walk in darkness? The most common answer that would come out of this is sin. If you're walking in sin, you're walking in darkness. That's true to a degree. But I want to carry us into a little bit deeper understanding of the truth of this scripture. If we walk in darkness, picture yourself walking in a dark room, then you're automatically not walking in light. If you walk in light, you're not walking in darkness. There's no merging. You're either walking in the light or you're walking in darkness. And what happens when we walk in darkness, we're separated from that fellowship. Now, is it sin itself that's separating us from that fellowship? Here's what I want you to understand. This is key. One of the most important things I am going to say to you today in this verse The separation of our fellowship, walking in the light versus walking in the darkness, is this. When we are walking in the light, we are walking in the righteousness of God. In other words, right by God's actions, not right by our actions. And when we are walking in darkness... We are walking in righteousness according to us. That's self-righteousness. Now, to make sure we, we get our minds around this, walking in the light is totally dependent on what God has done for us. It's dependent upon His righteous action, how He sees us because of what He has done. When we walk in darkness... Even if we're trying to do the right thing, if we are relying on our own self-righteousness, our own ability to do the right thing, not walking on God's righteousness, we are walking in darkness. So are we walking with God or are we walking in darkness? Self-righteousness is our own ability to do the right thing. And quite frankly, that's worldly thinking. We say, I got to do this better. I can do this better. It's all about I and me and my strength and my power. And scripture plainly says, says that our best is nothing. It is unrighteous. It is filthy rags to God. But when we decide to walk in what Jesus has done or God has done through Jesus Christ, we're walking in his righteousness and the power that he can cleanse us from all sins. Then we are walking in the light. Righteousness according to God is with what God did through Jesus Christ. Walk in the light. Look what it says in verse 7. But if we walk in the light, we walk in the power and righteousness of God, not ourselves, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. How? Because the blood of Jesus has cleansed us from all sin. I hope you see this truth. It is life-changing. You know, so many times people read this section and they think, well, it it says that if I'm with God, I've got to be perfect. I'm walking in the light. That means I'm not sinning, but then I do sin. And so that I'm not, I've separated from God. What do I do? You're relying on self-righteousness. Rely on God's perfect, imputed righteousness to us. And we will walk in the light. Verse 7 again, if we walk in the light, dependent totally on God and what God has done as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. Who was that one another with? With the disciples before all believers, with Jesus Christ himself and with God. We have fellowship with God because and the blood of Jesus Christ's son 
Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. So, walk in the light as he is in the light. We have fellowship with one another. But if we walk on our own righteousness, our own self-righteousness, we will fail. Real quickly, to get an understanding of this, I want to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. As it describes for us, Paul in the letter, second letter to the church of Corinth, describes how this righteousness works. He says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting at verse 16. Wherefore, henceforth know, excuse me, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. What is the new creature? The Holy Spirit has come into your life. Old things are passed away, all right? The old way of living is passed away. I'm new. I have a new creature. He goes on, behold, all things become new. I'm starting this new journey in my life. Verse 18, and all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. God created us to be in fellowship with him. Sin separated us from that fellowship, but God has reconciled. He's brought us back together through what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross. He goes on to wit, verse 19, that God was in Christ. This was God's design, reconciling the world unto himself. He's allowing the whole world to be reconciled back to him. How? By not imputing their trespasses to them. In other words, God is seeing us sin, and he is not giving us what, what we deserve for those sins, which is death. No, he's saying, I'm not going to impute the penalty for those sins because of your belief in Jesus Christ, because of my grace. He goes on. He says, he not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, ye be reconciled to God. How? Let's look at what God does in verse 21. For he, that's talking of God, for he hath made him, the him is Jesus. God made Jesus to be sin for us. Jesus was perfect. God removed his perfect godly righteousness and he took our unrighteousness and he imputed it to Jesus before Jesus went to the cross. And he took Jesus' perfect righteousness, godly righteousness, and that he imputed to us. In other words, when God looks at his Christian children, he sees the righteousness of of Jesus Christ. He goes, For he hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So when we go back now in 1 John, I hope you're with me. This is so important to basic truth and freedom in Jesus Christ. We're going to talk about sin a little bit later. I'm not saying sin doesn't matter, but you've got to understand the grace of God and what is being talked about in walking in the light versus walking in darkness. Walking in the light, according to 1 John, is walking with God. It is dependent on God's action of righteousness, what God has accomplished for us through Jesus Christ. If we walk in darkness, we're depending on our own self-righteousness. And even though we may know what is right and wrong and we're trying hard as we can to do right, we will do wrong. We will fail by our works. So he says, walk in the light, walk according to God's way of righteousness, not self-righteousness. Then he says this in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, excuse me, verse 8. If we say we have no sin, then if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Here's what I want you to see here. If we say we have no sin nature, then the truth is not in us. We've got to understand, I by myself cannot do what is right in God's eyes. It takes the power of God 
through a cleansing of Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit in my life for me to live there. He goes on. If we confess our sins, those that are walking with God in the righteousness of God, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have no sin, no sin nature, we're trusting in our own ability and we're walking in darkness. We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Our unrighteousness can only be dealt with by what Jesus Christ has accomplished on the cross. So, let's stop here for just a second and review. This is so important. First of all, we have to have faith in Jesus Christ, the gospel message of Jesus Christ as our starting point. It is essential. If you do not believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the rest of this does not matter. That is first. Right after that, understand, we don't want to quench the Spirit. We want to accept the Spirit into our lives. Right after that, we have to understand this truth um, that belief in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone and what he has done is the beginning of our fellowship with God. It is where our fellowship comes from. Understanding this truth is, is where fellowship with God begins. And when we fellowship with God, there's a promise we will be full of joy. God is light. There's no darkness around him. What is darkness? Darkness is sin and trying to do the right thing on our own. That's self-righteousness. So what are we to do? We're to walk in the light, walk with God, with the understanding that it is by God's grace alone I am seen as righteousness, as it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let me carry us just a little bit further to reinforce this concept. If you would, go with me to the book of Galatians. In Galatians chapter 5, Paul has been talking to the church um, here, and, and what is being said, he's talking about those that are trying to just follow the law. And he's saying, why are you trying to follow the law again? You've been freed from the law. Walk in the Spirit. The law is you by yourself trying to always do the right thing. And so this is what he says in Galatians 5, verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty, the freedom, wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. He's saying, don't go back under just the rules and trying to depend on your Yourself. You'll be in bondage. Now, let's skip forward. In verses 16 through 18, he says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit. That's walking in the light, walking with God. Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things ye would. Let me bring this same thought. Walking in the Spirit is walking totally dependent on God. Walking in the flesh is being totally dependent in your own self-ability. And they fight against each other. Our self fights against the Holy Spirit. But we are to make a conscious decision, renewing our mind to walk in in the light, or walk after the Spirit. Then he says this as we go a little bit further. Um, verse 20, 22 through 25. But the fruit of the Spirit, these are things that are results of the Holy Spirit in our life. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. There's no keeping this law. He goes on. And they that are Christ have crucified. They've put to death the flesh with the affections and lust. And he says, if we live in the Spirit, in other words, we've accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. The Spirit is inside of us. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. How do I know that this is talking about God's righteousness versus self-righteousness? Look at the last verse of this chapter. 
let us not be desirous of vain glory. In other words, don't let this be about yourself and your ability. Walking in the Spirit is walking totally dependent on God, what God has done in your life. Now, putting it all together, we want to know the will of God and walk according to God's will. Accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you've not accepted the gospel message, stop quenching the Spirit. Allow the truth of that message to come into your life and by faith accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. For Christians, after we're a Christian, consecrate yourselves. Present yourselves to God. God, here I am. All right, I'm ready for you to do something with me. After we consecrate ourselves to God, start to separate yourself from the world. Not getting out of the world, but stop thinking the way the world thinks. Stop thinking what the world thinks is important and start being transformed by God's Word. Read God's Word. Meditate on God's Word. Understand it. Allow transformation to renew your mind. Stop grieving the Holy Spirit. As we see God's Word and the truths of it, we start to see things God would have us do. And we don't do those things. We're grieving the Holy Spirit of God. But it's okay. It's not leaving us. He's still there. But grieving means there's fellowship that has been broken between us and God. How do we deal with that fellowship? We rely on God's righteousness, not our righteousness. It's not about us always doing the right thing. But when we fail, we go back to God. 1 John chapter 1 verse 9, we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. We're relying on the righteousness of God. Rely on the promises of God's righteousness by what Jesus accomplished. And as you read and meditate on God's Word, the Holy Spirit will reveal truths in Scripture, and we will slowly desire those truths walking in the Spirit, confirming God's will in our life. You know, let me give you this practical example, and I know I'm almost out of time. Let's say, I'll just pick a sin. Let's say I'm an alcoholic. And I've had problems with drinking. How do I put this in action? First and foremost, I need to be a child of God. I need to accept that I'm God's child, put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. From there, I want to present myself to God. Well, I'm not presenting myself holy and acceptable to God if I'm drinking and staying a drunk. So what have I got to do with that? I have got to ask God to help cleanse me from this sin. Not only to cleanse me, but to give me the power to overcome. Here's what that looks like. God, help me. Forgive me of my sins. I confess them to you. Allow your Holy Spirit into my life. Give me the strength not to drink. Five minutes later, just five minutes later, God, thank you for those five minutes. Thank you for not allowing me to drink for those five minutes. An hour later, God, thank you. I'm struggling here, God, but you have given me the power for an hour and five minutes now. I've not taken a drink. Let this go on for three or four days in this example. I'm three days in. God, I have not had a drink. I've had a desire, but I haven't. God, thank you for you giving me strength, you giving me power. That's walking in God's righteousness. And you know what may happen? Happen. In day six, I may fall off the rocker. I may pick up a drink. You know what? Start again. God, forgive me for what I have done. I don't want to do this, God. Forgive me. Give me the strength to overcome. Five minutes later, God, thank you for this. And you know what will happen if you continue this process? The transformation that is taking place in your mind by the Holy Spirit's power, God will lead you to overcome that sin. You may be two and three years down the road and never have taken that drink. Well, what happens next? I guarantee you, there's another revelation of truth of God's Word, another sin, something else that's separating us in our fellowship with God. And we see we could have even a closer walk if we did away with that bad language. God, thank you for removing the desire to drink. 
Thank you for healing me of that challenge. And God, I want you to know I have a foul mouth and I want you to heal me of that. God, I want you to give me the strength to do this. Thank you for what you've done, but God, give me the strength to walk even closer to you as it has been revealed to me in your word. God, thank you for five minutes for not allowing me to have filthy mouth. God, thank you for this conversation that I was just in. I normally would have taken apart. Thank you for not allowing me to do that. And when I fail and say something, God, forgive me of my sin. Forgive me for my foul mouth. Start me new. Allow your spirit to be stirred in me. What I want you to see is these processes over and over. God will deal with things in our life one by one, not relying on our strength, but walking in the light means walking in fellowship with him, relying on his strength. It is not giving us permission to sin. No, in fact, if we walk in the light, his conviction will come over us more and more about things in our life. And if we call on him walking in the spirit, he will give us the strength and the power to overcome, not by our righteousness, but by the righteousness of God. Let me end with this. 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, as we put this to a close. My little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. When you sin, God, forgive me of my sins. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Propitiation means he's the covering. He's covered up our sins. He goes on, And hereby we do know that we are known of him if we keep his commandments. I presented myself to God. I'm starting to separate from the world. I'm being transformed by God's word. God is revealing his truth to me. And so I'm counting on his righteousness, walking in the light. And when I sin, I'm not seen by God as a sinner because I'm immediately going to him, confessing my sins, and he sees me as his righteous child. I'm walking on his righteousness. He goes on, verse 5, But whosoever keepeth his word... Trust in God, walk in the Spirit, walk in the light. In Him verily is the love of God perfected. Did you see that? God is going to carry you from your starting point into perfection. You're not going to get there tomorrow. This is a process that you can live in fellowship with God and the joy of your life right now. It says that the love of God would be perfected. Hereby know we that we are in Him. And he that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk, even as he walked. Walk in the light. Walk in the light. And when you fail, count on the righteousness of God, not your self-righteousness. Jesus will forgive you of your sins. He'll give you a new starting point. And this, my friends, is how we walk in God's will, walking in His Spirit. Heavenly Father, thank You for the truths of Your Word today. And God, I know there may be questions that come from this Word shared today. God, I ask You to give each individual an ability to, to discern, to understand. Allow the Holy Spirit to show the truth of these words of Your message. And God, for those that need further, need further guidance, may they reach out, may they call us, may they email us, may they come see us. And God, would your love just abound. God, would you just transform this world for you. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.